Good morning and welcome to Global Healthcast 16 on this October 11, 2022. We are very proud to present to you today our new version after we had reached more than 100,000 clicks last week. So thanks for joining us and please stay with us. I am Joe Schmidt and with me today is Dr. Melvin Senecas. Good morning to Switzerland. Good morning, Melvin. Good morning, Professor Schmidt and good morning Good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're watching this Global Healthcast from. Our topics today are COVID-19 update. It is nothing new on monkeypox. Actually, we won't show any slide. The news is there is declining numbers. Very good. We have some data on excess deaths from COVID-19 in US Republican versus Democrats. We cover primary liver cancer, a global view. We cover the 2022 Nobel Well Prize in Medicine, and we will cover upcoming RSV vaccines. We finally made it. Melvin, what is news with COVID-19? Yes, so like what we do every week, we start with this quick global COVID epi update, and we get this from the WHO COVID situation report that you can see online. And this is not real time, and this is a week late, and keep in mind that countries now don't test as much, right? So globally, you will see that the number of weekly cases decreased by 6% as compared to the previous week. Um, and the number of weekly deaths also decreased by 12% as compared to the previous week. And it is still the unvaccinated and the older adults and immunocompromised who have been vaccinated but not boosted who are ending up in on the next slide, you will see um, the pooled rate in Europe for all age groups. And as you will see here, cases have been rising for the past two weeks. And this coincided with a drop in temperature in, in Europe. The number of people being hospitalized are also starting to increase, if you see on the next slide. Here you will see that um, in countries in Europe, number of patients in, in hospitals are also increasing. Um, and we don't have the data on deaths yet because as we know, death deaths is a, a lagging indicator. Um, it still continued to fall in, uh, in, in Europe, but as the CDC noted that the deaths declined 10% last week compared to the week before, but they forecast that um, deaths will start to show an increasing trend next week in the coming weeks. Very interesting. So, um, yeah, I think if you get COVID and those who are going to die, that will take two weeks, right? So the lag period is due to the evolution of uh, the severity of the disease, making it into the intensive care and then maybe die in the end. So this is this is the reason for the lag. Very interesting. Now, uh, Melvin, I'm, uh, I'm very puzzled uh, about the next topic you found, and that is excess death rates for Republicans and Democrats during the COVID-19 pandemic. Where did you find this? Yes, so this, is, this publication is on the excess COVID deaths for Republicans and Democrats in the U.S. during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it is actually talking about um, the the different responses in the states uh the different states so ohio and florida data show more republican excess covid 19 deaths and also previous studies have shown that republican leaning counties have had higher covid 19 mortality rates than democrat leaning counties but this is the first attempt to understand the excess death risk at the individual level I think it's interesting to see that it's not just people's medical condition or religious affiliation that influence one's behavior or response to COVID-19, right? Um, political affiliation is also very influential. And in the study, one's political affiliation can really mean survival um, in a pandemic or, or not. Very interesting. So at the same time, I think it is all interlinked, right? If you're a Republican, you're more likely religious, you're more likely 
uh, whatever, you, you have more likely other beliefs as well. So this goes all together. It is, uh, but it's, it may be an independent factor even, right? If you're a Republican, uh, even if you're not religious, you would tend to not wear a mask. And uh, I mean, that was the message at least, right? Mm -hmm. So very interesting. And again, how did you find the paper? Were you looking for excess rates or what, how, how did you retrieve it from the deepness of the internet? So, so this was um, created by some uh, professors of public health and uh, the, the names are there, Jacob Wallace, Paul Goldsmith, Pinkham and Jason Schwartz. And they, they posted this on Twitter actually. Very interesting, yeah, <laughs> very nice, very good. And something that is very important because we have been vaccinating against hepatitis B for decades. And uh, particularly in Asia where the burden of hepatitis B and liver cancer was very high, this was, uh, this was very successful. So where are we today? And this is, I guess, covered in your next slide. Hmm. So, so this is a study from the International Agency for Research on Cancer, the IARC. Um, as you will see here, liver cancer was among the top three causes of cancer death in almost 50 countries in 2020, and 905,000 people were diagnosed, and 830,000 people died from liver cancer globally in 2020. That's a lot of number and liver cancer deaths are expected to rise, according to this study, to um, it's expected to rise 55% by 2040 because of the uptick of hepatitis B, hepatitis C, diabetes, alcohol consumption, obesity, and excess body weight. So basically it's just telling us that these are the things that we can actually modify our, our risk for um, liver cancer. So get your hepatitis B vaccine. Hepatitis C vaccination is in clinical studies, phase one, if I remember correctly. Uh, drinking less alcohol would yes. be uh, important and physical activity and normal body weight would be another factor. Yep, and control your blood sugar, yeah. Yeah, very nice, very interesting, very interesting data, very good advice for your health. Melvin, you also cover the 2022 Nobel Prize in Medicine. I'm sure you can explain why Svante Pebo received the prize. Yeah, so I, I wanted to talk about this Swedish geneticist whose work on Asian genomes and human evolution has landed him the 2022 um, Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine. And, you know, I had to ask my Swedish friends how to say his name, right? Svante Pebo. <laughs> So uh, on the next slide, you will see that really um, the, this prize is a recognition of the relevance of his work on paleogenomics, human origin, and archaeology, um, and its, its importance. It's also a recognition of the astonishing revelations about our deep history that have come from paleogenomics, which holds many untapped secrets about who we are today including settling the long debated question of whether the Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, us, um, ever encountered each other. And on the next slide, um, this is from the Nobel Prize Committee. It is a summary of the most amazing discovery of Svante, getting the first DNA sequences from the mitochondrial genome of a Neanderthal. Um, it was very human-like, but not like any human living today. And that was the first time they realized that it was indeed a DNA sequence from an extinct form of human. And he has uncovered several new information about our early human ancestors, including evidence that early humans interbred with Neanderthals and had children together, and an entirely new um, hominin subspecies, the Denisovians, uncovered from a single finger bone, and also they found a gene that may be pivotal to humans' ability to develop language. And so I think because of all these discoveries, um, he was given the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine. I think the real work, if I read this right, uh, the real work he did, the real innovation is uh, like being a detective 
to use this that has been changed by bacteria, by harsh winters and hot summers, uh, to put these things together and then come up with meaningful information. I think this is uh, this is really uh, the puzzle that he put together, and that was the daily difficult work. And it is against the odds that he was successful. So, um, yeah, it, it is great discoveries. And maybe we cover a little bit more of that topic uh, in another Global Health Cast, but it's, it, it is really great. Very nice. Melvin, uh, as you can imagine, I uh, I don't have five topics. I have one, and that is RSV. And actually, uh, I have to say that um, I cover it today because vaccines are on the horizon. Number one, the burden of disease of RSV is huge. If you are two years old, you've had RSV at least once. 50% have had it twice. 75% of hospitalizations of RSV occur in the first six months of life, and uh, actually 2% of infants make it to the hospital every year. So if you're born in, uh, in or before, just before winter, you have a 4% chance to make it to the hospital for RSV. It's very expensive. It fills pediatric wards every winter. The exception was this uh, COVID pandemic. RSV was gone, but it's back. You have repeated infections and there is a huge burden of disease in adults. And this is the number for the United States. People have been looking for RSV vaccines since the 90s and all failed. Uh, Wyeth was the first one and children who got the vaccine were more sick than those who did not get the vaccine. So in the end, the vaccine was a total failure. The reason is that the relevant epitope, the relevant antigen of RSV that induces protection is the F protein, the fusion protein. And that comes in a pre-fusion form and in a post-fusion form. And they are so different that the epitopes are different. So antibodies against the post-fusion, once the virus has entered the cell, they don't protect. And only the pre-fusion F, that gives you protection. And after this discussion, like nine years ago, after this discovery, all of a sudden, dozens of vaccine companies came up and produced different types of vaccines. The one that is already licensed is a monoclonal, long-acting monoclonal antibody. It, it lasts for like six months. It can protect for up to six months. And that is called Nisevimab, and that is already basically approved by, the, by EMA. And it is waiting for the signature of the European Commission. And once the signature is there, you can buy it in the pharmacy. So it's out there very, very soon. Then there is maternal antibody um, uh, immunization. So you vaccinate week 24 or a little bit later. And then the mother develops antibodies that are transferred to the child and they would protect you. That these trials by GSK and Pfizer are a little bit delayed because there was no RSV in the last seasons, not, not very much, so the trial just took longer. But uh, vaccines for adults are always on the, are also on the way. So this is everything that is upcoming. You will see it in the show notes if you want to download them later. There is a plethora of trials with nice names uh, from music trials, Medley and Melody and Evergreen, to paintings from Renoir and Matisse and to flowers, Daisy and Primrose. I really like the innovation here. But uh, this is the uh, phase two study from the Pfizer vaccine where you see the mothers get nice antibodies against both subtypes of uh, the RSV virus and their newborns get also nice titers and the transfer rate is like tenfold. So there's active transport of protecting antibodies from mother to child. Very good news, but the phase three data is still not available. Now, the Nisilimab, which will be called by Fortus, and that is produced by Sanofi and AstraZeneca, the vaccine efficacy against RSV medically attended is 70%, hospitalization 78%. For preterms, for late preterm, week 35 and later, the protection rate is 75% and 62% for hospitalization. So these are the two pivotal studies that will uh, make it to uh, the market, I guess, in the end. The, again, I was looking this morning, it was not signed yet by the European Commission, 
but uh, this can come out any day now. The details are written here. If you want to uh, look a little bit into the details, it's 50 milligram for those under five kilograms and 100 milligram for those more than five kilograms. Now, what are the key points? Should you use maternal immunization or monoclonal antibodies in the future? Well, you can say only, only maternal immunization, only monoclonal antibody. I think option three is the most likely to happen in developed countries. There should be universal maternal immunization, and you would, get, would give the monoclonal antibodies for preterm infants. Uh, and the reason is the maternal immunization may not be enough for preterms, because if you want to vaccinate the mother at gestational age 25, 26 weeks, and you have a preterm infant, there wasn't enough antibody transferred from mother to child, so the child would not be protected. So this is the classical situation where you should use the long-acting monoclonal antibody. You could also think of giving the monoclonal for risk children in the first and second winter, uh, but the second winter, this is not approved. It is not in the label. The label particularly says it should be given in the first season. There is no data for the second season. This, there was no study. I'm not aware of the study in the second winter, and this is why this is not licensed. In the future, there will also be an active toddler vaccine. What, how, how would you decide? You could say, I go by benefit. Who gives me more reduction of hospitalization? You can look at the price. You can look, is the product available? It will be very difficult, I guess, to produce hundreds of millions or you know, let's say tens of millions of doses of a long-acting monoclonal antibody. And the question is, what will be the price? You need good RSV surveillance. You need to tell everybody, this is the week it started. And then you need to vaccinate 800,000, or let's say, I'm not sure it will not be 800,000, but those who have their first winter, it may be some hundred thousand children, um, infants in Germany alone. And the question is, is there enough logistics? Will all pediatricians reach the children that are in need of the monoclonal antibody? So th these are all decision points, and uh, um, I'm not the one to make the decision, but this is what um, NITEX uh, around the globe will have to decide on. That was uh, the pediatric part, and also on the adult part, there is a challenge study uh, with an active vaccine. Uh, and what you see here is the viral load in the vaccine group is very, very low compared to placebo. And also the symptom score is much lower in the vaccinated group. So adult vaccine will also be available very shortly. And that's all today. I'm not sure, Melvin, any any questions on RSV? Any comments from your point or anything you would like to add here? No, I think this actually looks very good. The viral load by RT-PCR assay, it looks very good. Yeah, and MR, MRT uh, PCR is very sensitive. So this is yeah. nothing here, right? Yeah. yeah. Very good. So we gave you COVID-19 update. Globally, numbers go down. They do go up again with a drop in temperatures, particularly in Europe. And monkeypox is going down. We told you that there are excess deaths uh, in uh, with from COVID-19 in US Republicans. We told you that primary liver cancer may be on the rise from a global view. We told you about uh, paleoarchaeology or paleogenetics, um, uh, uh, you know, finding the genes of ancient humans, the uh, great, uh, great Nobel Prize. And I told you everything about the uh, RSV vaccines that will be available maybe as of tomorrow, but very, very soon you will have very nice options. In the end, we would like to express our support to the many women who risk their lives and well-being in Iran, taking off their headscarf and protesting against oppression in their country. This is a picture from a street in Iran, which was covered in a German newspaper. And this is a picture from uh, Paris, actually, uh, a painting uh, on the walls in Paris streets where young women uh, cut off their hair as a sign of protest. Melvin, it was a pleasure to have you again this morning. Thank you, Professor Schmidt, and thank you everyone for watching or, or listening. Um, have a nice day or afternoon or evening. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.